All right, so now this question is a bit different and uh, oh, sorry, and I am not a uh, big fan of this type of question, but let's take a look at this. All right now, uh, the reason I'm not a big fan of it because you don't really get taught this way. Okay, so here you can see that we have a few equipments here. We have the ring stand, we have a force sensor, which will sense the force that's, uh, that it's being applied to the uh, sensor. We have a cart that moves, and we have a cardboard target, and we have a uh, motion detector. Now, I want to make sure that you know the function of these detectors. What is the uh, function of a motion detector? To detect specifically what part of motion? Louder? Velocity, yes. So, uh, so this one is to detect velocity okay motion detector is to detect velocity and of course uh the force sensor is to well to detect force now if you look at the question okay it says carlos and dominic uh have been challenged to design experiments to determine the impulse now may i ask you to write the impulse formula at the top of the page it's pretty lengthy because it could equal to uh different things, J is equal to what? J is equal to what? Anybody? J is equal to? J is equal to anybody? You're writing something. Tell me what you wrote. First, J, the impulse, aka the change of momentum. Okay, momentum is mass times velocity. Since it is the change of momentum, it is mass times the change of velocity. At the same time, we can also find out the impulse by using the equation of force times delta T. And if you ever wonder how come uh, we have this kind of uh, change, it's all because of the fact that uh, A is equal to change of velocity over change of T. So delta V is equal to A times delta T. And when this it's plugged into here. Mass times acceleration is force. That's why we have an F right there. Okay. So, so that's the impulse. Uh, to determine the impulse given to the car, to a cart as it collides with a uh, with a barrier, using two different mathematical or graphical ways. Dominic sketches the the following diagram of the laboratory setup and writes the procedure below, okay? So, now, what are the two ways? These are the two ways, basically. Why do we have two detectors? One detects the force because we can use the force times delta T. Why do, I, why do we have a motion, motion detector? Because we're gonna detect the velocity, specifically, we need to find out the change of velocity, which means that we are going to need to know our initial velocity and our final velocity, okay? So that's the thought process behind the lab setup, okay? What are we trying to do? Oh, we are trying to uh, determine the impulse and we know the equations and how do we get the data that we need to get the information, okay? So, so that's the beginning. And now the exciting part right here, next page. Now, so this is the uh, very comprehensive list of steps. And the question is, are they all necessary? 
if they are not necessary, could you cross them out? Okay. Now, let me give you a, and this is where, again, why I didn't like this experiment, uh, this kind of question. Not that this is an unfair question. It's just that the way it is taught in school is not the same as just the assessment. So that's why it's somewhat unfair to you all uh, when you are learning these uh, content. Now, let me give you a little standard okay, of what should be included in the procedure. Okay. Number one. We do not write down a step that says, please make sure to breathe. Okay? I mean, anything that's common sense, we do not include. Let me tell you what is considered a common sense. Get all materials. Okay? I mean, come on. Should I remind you to uh, brush your teeth? Take a shower the night before? We don't, right? That's common sense. We just need to focus on what is required to do for this particular experiment. If I do not remind you, you really will not know. And now, of course, what kind of person are we writing this uh, procedure to? Now, here's the thing. People would argue and say, well, you know, some people are really stupid. They really don't know. Yes, I agree. Some people are not very well educated, but we're not really targeting those people as a target audience. We're talking to people who are really engaged in this whole learning uh, the whole learning experience. And, and we would say the things that we, the things that, uh, that we don't tell, they would really miss out. So we say number one, yeah, people should know, okay? Because uh, if you are, if you are designing, if you have drawn the picture, you know what to pick up. We should not need to remind people to say, hey, get in the materials. Should we include number two? You should, because uh, if not, you may have the cart, but you don't know that it is necessary to know the mass of the cart. Uh, it is also important to know the mass of the cart because it is part of our calculation. It is part of our calculation in the uh, determination of uh, the impulse. So we say yes. Number two, we keep it. All right, now I will go ahead and take, uh, let you take a look what steps would be uh, redundant that would deserve the elimination of it. From question, uh, from, from step three through nine, is there any step? that you'd say, uh, yeah, we should keep it. Which one? Okay, all right. Secure the motion detector to the running stand. Attach the uh, cardboard target so to the car so that it can be seen by the motion sensor. Now, so I would like to agree that we might want to be very clear about these. However, according to uh, the college board, none of these steps would be necessary. Now, and this is why I want to go through this because you may not realize that, wow, really, this is the standard? that we really don't have to be that clear and people would know it? And the answer is yes, okay? Uh, and again, that's why I didn't like this kind of question because you were not taught, trained that way in school. So I would totally understand why you would want to include some of these steps. And this is precisely the reason why I wanna go through this activity because they are not necessary, okay? So, so, the, uh, so you have to understand the logic behind the exclusion of these. So the idea is that, so if you know that you are using a motion sensor, then we expect you to know how it works, okay? It's just that I give you a phone, I expect you to know how to use the phone. I would not need to teach you and say, oh, you know what? Please go ahead and swipe, uh, swipe, uh, swipe right to unlock the phone. 
I mean, I expect you to know it. You're pretty smart. Same thing right here. We expect people to know how to use the motion sensor. We know, we expect people to know how to use the, uh, uh, the force detector. So we expect people to know how to secure this. Like if not, like will we expect them to not know how to attach the uh, detector? We'll say, this should be okay. Now, number 10, we include, okay? Number 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, we will all include. We will not include 15 though. 15 is one of those uh, common sense things. But I would say that in the chem labs that you did previously in high school chemistry, we did put clean up at the end because from the teacher's perspective, if we don't say it, kids may not do it. So again, it's not fair. Now, so we will keep 10 to 14 with two modifications. Okay, and I wanna go through these two modifications. Number one, got to change step number since we excluded we excluded some steps, so we would not just uh, repeat nine through twelve. We actually will repeat ten to thirteen. Okay, we actually will repeat number thirteen as well in the determining of uh, in the determination of impulse. And I'm going to put a little star right here for. Question 13. Okay. Now, what I want to, the reason why I want to put a star next to it is because when it sets, the step it sets uh, determine the impulse. There's a lot more to follow that it's not including. Like, how? Do you know how to determine the impulse? You don't. And that's where we need extra clarity. And we are going to talk about this in the next five to 10 minutes, okay? So how do we determine the impulse? Let's go to the next page first and then we'll come back to the procedure. Now, as we said earlier, we said there are two ways to determine the impulse. And we have the equation, right? We have the equation of J is equal to M times delta V. And we have J is equal to force times uh, uh, delta T, okay? So that's how we have the two ways of finding out the impulse of this collision. And as I said earlier, we use the motion detector to detect, to detect velocity and it will be the detection of the initial velocity and the final velocity. So my question is this, between the initial velocity and final velocity, Would these two numbers, the magnitude, would the magnitudes of these two numbers be the same or different? Okay. Looking at the, uh, the picture right here. So the car is going to travel forward. All right. The car is going to travel forward right here. And then it hits the sensor. It's going to bounce back. So the question is, would the initial velocity which is the velocity it has before hitting the sensor, be the same as the velocity after hitting the sensor, okay? Just like this. I'm gonna throw this water bottle into the, uh, onto the window. Would the velocity that I throw the water bottle be the same as the speed that it bounces off the window? What do you mean by shaking your head? It wouldn't be the same. So which one is larger? Initial is larger. Okay, now two weeks ago when we were talking about these uh, momentum stuff, I also asked you all to uh, do some calculations about kinetic energy. And one thing that we know is that whenever there is a collision like this, like a blind person can tell there's a collision because you can hear. And the reason why you can hear is because some energy is being converted to sound energy. And that's why when you have a collision, it does not matter if it's an elastic or inelastic collision. Whenever there's a collision like this that you can hear, you can see, there will not be a conservation of energy. So that is the reason why 
that the velocity initial is going to be bigger than the uh, uh, velocity final. And um, now, could you use your pencil to sketch, just sketch what this graph may look like? Okay, the velocity time graph. I want you to give it a try. What do you think about the spectrum? Now, let me tell you what I saw yesterday. I saw a student doing this. And I was like, how? Can you point out the problem of this graph? Yeah, a few problems with this graph. And it would be a good review of your semester one kinematic stuff. And that's how critical you have to be when you look, when you look at a graph. When we talk about this cart going to the sensor, okay? Going to the left, going forward to the sensor. That velocity should be the same. Because why should it be the same? If you say the velocity is increasing like this, that means there's an acceleration. And that means there is a force. Then you better name the force. It's your responsibility to name the force if you say it is changing velocity. But there is no change of velocity, number one. Number two, it goes to the highest point and then it drops down. But you know what's happening for the whole, the entirety of this motion? The cart keeps on going forward because there's no negative velocity. If it bounces off the sensor, that means it will be moving backward. So therefore, you have to have some you have to have some initial velocity. So one, two, three, four, five. Now it doesn't matter. I'm going to use this as our initial velocity. And you're going to have some final velocity that's on the negative side. All right. So that's the first thing that I want to emphasize here. That how do you write your VI and how do you put where do you put your VF? We already determined that uh, we already determined the, the fact that uh, VI, uh, the speed initially, it's bigger than the speed final. So therefore, uh, that's the explanation of these two, uh, these squares away from the x-axis. And now, here's the main point between this graph and the next graph. So, Let's just say that it would go forward for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six squares, okay? So it's gonna travel six squares to the right. I mean, six squares here. Now, you have to determine what is the time interval that it has the collision. There's no set value, it's up to you. I don't care. But what I do care is that you need to make sure that the window of collision is consistent between this graph and the next graph. So I would say, all right, yeah, let's go ahead, make it like six squares in the initial segment and then six squares in the middle segment. And then afterwards, it's just, uh, you know, afterwards, it's just uh, stable final velocity. Okay. And now, how do we translate to the graph on the right? Well, there was no collision until the sixth square. So we're going to put a mark right there. And then the collision is over after another six squares. Okay, so I'm going to put the mark right here. And now, here comes the most challenging part. Should the force be positive or negative? Should the force be positive or negative? Now, let me uh, go back to the picture right here.
the cart initially goes to the left and we would use that as positive. Going to the left is positive. And the force is going to the right. So therefore, the force that we are depicting on the graph must be negative. It doesn't matter where you put on your peak as long as you have a negative force. So keep that in mind. Okay? Keep that in mind on how you look at these subtleties of the steps. Okay? And I can guarantee you that on a test, there will be a question similar to this, or they would give you a graph, just like your master in physics, that uh, you would look at the area uh, between the curve and the axis to, to tell the impulse. Yes. Why is the what? Why is the force not constant? Very good question. Now, so uh, yesterday uh, I used this uh, as a little example. So imagine that I run, imagine I throw myself to the window, okay? So it's like this, this is the window, okay? And then as my head approaches to the window, like this is my initial contact, there's a little bit of force. And then we like this, right? That's the highest force. And then afterwards, I, my head bounces off, the force drops off, okay? So that's why it's a gradient instead of a constant level of force. That's a very good question, okay? So, uh, so imagine, how you hit something, right? You hit something or you have a pillow. When you go to bed tonight, you, uh, you put your head onto your pillow. You realize that, wait, hold on. The very first moment I put my head in contact with the pillow, I mean, there's a force, it's a light force. But as you put your head deeper into your pillow, then uh, the force is going to be stronger. Okay, so that's why it's a gradient instead of a constant level thing. Any other question? Oh, that would be, uh, if you crash your pillow, that means you have a really big spike, but in a negative position, in a negative direction. That's a very good thing to ask. If you crash your mattress, same thing. I used to do that all the time when I was a kid. That gives me uh, a lot of fun because there's no phone back in the days. So I'm gonna invent my own game to so have fun in a boring house. Just keep crashing through the mattress. I think there's a song, right? The song, uh, the ch children's song, like five monkeys jumping on the couch. Something like that? Yeah. My son listened to it. All right, now. So that is how we measure our data, how we use our data to calculate impulses. And, and that is what we do with the description of number 13. Now, let me go ahead and uh, give you the, uh, the official, official, official uh, response to this segment in this uh, task, this part. So I want you to make sure that you practice or analyze the language of how they describe number 13. It says, determine the impulse by analyzing the force versus time graph created by the force sensor. The area under the force versus time graph will be the impulse, okay? Very simple, we just say, hey, you get the graph, use the area. Okay, and then the two ways, right? The two ways to determine the impulse, then you will include another paragraph that says, hey, you know what? The impulse can also be determined by the velocity versus time graph, and you will be looking at the initial and final velocity to determine the change of momentum, which is, aka, impulse. Okay, and then you just say, hey, if you just found the change of velocity multiplied by the mass, voila, you get your impulse. Okay, that is all we're asking, all the college board is asking in terms of the clarity, the specificity, 
of your steps. Okay, just tell what you were supposed to do, and that's all. So you would look at 13 and say, ha, huh, I mean, thanks for telling us that to determine the impulse, but how? You didn't say how, let's clarify it, okay? But to an average person's eyes, you may not realize that this is insufficient. So that's how you contrast it and say, oh, that's how we do it. And then, uh, and then explain how these representations can be used to determine the impulse given to the cart during the collision. Explain how you could determine the impulse given to the cart from each graph. Okay, so basically repeating what you said earlier uh, from the steps that you wrote. And I will give you the uh, official, official uh, response right here so that you can uh, go home and take a look at it. In terms of calculations, a uh, few things that I would expect you to know what to do. Uh, in terms of calculations, I expect you to firmly know the difference in the change of um, uh, the, 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 the law of conservation momentum. Okay, how um, we have the two equations, one for elastic and one for inelastic collisions. Okay, and then... Um, and then on the other hand, I expect that you know how to combine the law of conservation of energy on, uh, in, on this, uh, in this uh, unit so that you know sometimes we can tell the, I wonder if there's a change in elevation that could also determine the change of uh, kinetic energy. Anyways, I'll insert it later. All right, any questions? Yes. Perfect elastic end. All right now, so uh, a perfectly elastic collision. That's a very good question. Now we don't really see it in real life because uh, it rarely happens. A perfectly elastic collision means that it does not lose any kinetic energy. So imagine a bouncy ball would keep on bouncing forever. Uh, that would be a scenario of perfectly elastic collision, okay? If you uh, take a look at uh, gas laws that we talked about previously in uh, chemistry, we assume the gas particles in the air to collide against these uh, walls perfectly elastically. Because you wouldn't want or you wouldn't think that the uh, gas particles would hit on these containers or these walls and then it just rests on the floor. Because if that's the case, how would you breathe? You'd be like laying down on the floor to sniff up all these oxygen molecules. That's not the case. And the reason why it's not the case is because they keep on having these kinetic energy to move around still, which we will assume that it does not have, uh, it does not experience any loss of kinetic energy for that matter. Okay, so that's the uh, difference between elastic and uh, perfectly elastic. It's just the, uh, the, 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 the amount of kinetic energy that it has. Okay? Good. All right, so I would suggest you to uh, look at all the notes that I sent you uh, before, all the exercises. I mean, the calculations are not meant to be very difficult or challenging, but just make sure that you are aware of the scenarios. Make sure you read and there's a picture in your head so that you know what equation to use.